9876. Welcome everyone to the fifth panel of the Carnegie China Global Dialogue Series for 2022-2023. My name is Paul Hanley and I'm the director of Carnegie China and I'm glad to be joined today by colleagues and friends Mahayaya, my counterpart in Beijing, uh, with the Carnegie Endowment, the director of the Malcolm H. Kerr Carnegie Middle East Center. Uh, Dr. Yu Jie, a senior research fellow at Chatham House uh, in London. And Benjamin Ho, assistant professor at Rajaratnam School of International Studies, RSIS, here in Singapore, although he's calling in uh, this evening uh, from Brunei. And I'm looking forward to a terrific discussion tonight and the topic is uh, China's growing involvement uh, in the Middle East. For those of you who are not familiar with our Carnegie Global Dialogue series, uh, this is the 11th year that we have hosted these, uh, this series. Carnegie China Global Dialogue series uh, is a set of panel discussions that examines China's evolving foreign policy and international role from the perspective of Carnegie scholars at each of our global centers. Uh, along with international experts from across the globe. Turning to today's discussion, let me introduce each of our experts. Maha Yaya, as I mentioned, is the director of the Malcolm H. Kerr Carnegie Middle East Center. Uh, there, her research focuses on citizenship, pluralism, and social justice in the aftermath of the Arab uprisings. Prior to joining Carnegie, Yaya uh, Maha led work on participatory development and social justice at the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia. Uh, Maha has also worked with the United Nations Development Program in Lebanon, where she was director and the principal author of the National Human Development Report, 2008-2009, toward a citizen state. Maha, thanks for joining tonight. It's great to see you on the screen and it was great to see you in person a couple of weeks ago. Second uh, with us tonight, next with us is uh, Dr. Yu Jia. Uh, Yu Jia is a senior research fellow on China uh, in the Asia Pacific program at Chatham House in London. And there her research focuses on the decision-making process of Chinese foreign policy, as well as China's economic diplomacy. Yuja previously served as the head of China Foresight uh, at LSC Ideas and remains an associate fellow there. LSE recognized uh, Yuja as one of its leading women in 2018 for her contributions in teaching and engaging the public debates on China's foreign affairs. Yuja, thank you very much for joining us tonight as well. And last but not least, um, I'll mention Benjamin last only because he's the closest one to me here in the Asia Pacific region. Thought he was going to be calling in from Singapore tonight, but he tells me he's in Brunei teaching uh, at the Defense Academy. Uh, but it's great to have you, Benjamin, uh, assistant professor at the China program in the Roger Rotnam School of International Studies here in Singapore. Uh, there is research focus it includes the study of China's internal relations with an emphasis on China's political worldview and exceptionalism. He's the author of a terrific book, called China's Political Worldview and Chinese Exceptionalism, International Order and Global Leadership uh, came out in 2021. Benjamin, thanks again for joining us. Before we quick off, uh, kick off the discussion, let me just say a couple of housekeeping items. First of all, we do want to allow the audience to ask our experts questions during today's discussion. And if you wanna submit a question, use the chat function on YouTube. Second, we will post a recording of this discussion as an episode on our China in the World podcast, and you can find that conversation, this conversation, and then all the previous Carnegie China uh, Global Dialogues and our previous podcasts on the website uh, and all major podcast streaming platforms. And with that, let's kick off the discussion. So as I mentioned, uh, today's topic of discussion will focus on recent developments in the future of China-Middle East relations. The Middle East uh, is an increasingly important region in the context of US-China competition, but it's also uh, an important and complex region, of course, on its own terms. This week, US Secretary of State Anthony Blinken visited Saudi Arabia uh, 
uh, with the aim of regaining influence with Saudi uh, over oil prices, uh, countering to some extent Chinese and Russian influence in the region, and nurturing hopes for an eventual normalization of Saudi-Israeli ties. Of course, the Biden administration has had difficulty managing the United States' longstanding partnership with Saudi Arabia as the two countries have clashed over human rights, OPEC oil cuts, and the war in Yemen, just to name a few. Meanwhile, China has been currying favor with many countries in the Middle East, including Saudi Arabia. And in early April of this year, we saw China brokered an agreement in, in Beijing for Saudi Arabia and Iran to restore diplomatic relations and to reduce mutual security tensions throughout the region. On Tuesday of this week, Iran reopened its embassy in Saudi Arabia for the first time in seven years. In other areas as well, we see China seems to be taking on a larger political role potentially in the Middle East. On April 17th, the new Chinese foreign minister, Qing Gang, held separate phone calls with both Israeli prime, the Israeli prime minister and the Palestinian minister of foreign affairs. And the Chinese officials have also described the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear agreement, as a, quote, key pillar of international nuclear nonproliferation regime and has called for relaunching of indirect talks between the United States and Iran. Of course, earlier this week, the US, France, Germany, and the UK resumed talks on how to deal with the Iran nuclear crisis after suspending talks with Iran last September when Tehran rejected a draft proposal to revive the 2015 nuclear deal, launched a violent crackdown on anti-regime protesters and sold armed drones to Russia and detained a number of European nationals. With all of that on the table, I'm delighted to be joined, as I mentioned, by my colleagues and friends to consider the following questions. How can Beijing play, what, what role can Beijing play in mediating regional disputes in the Middle East? How are Middle East states responding to the rising U.S.-China rivalry? And will China replace the United States as the leading outside power in the Middle East? Let me start with my first question, if I could, and I I'll start with Maha, and then we'll go to the other experts. So starting with the Iran-Saudi uh, detente or normalization agreement in uh, this year, in the spring this year, China helped broker this deal, uh, hosting the Saudi state minister and the Iranian uh, secretary of the Supreme National Security Council. And according to the agreement, both sides will reopen embassies. They'll uphold the April 2022 ceasefire in Yemen. They'll begin work on a formal peace agreement to end the civil war. Iran will cease supplying Houthi rebels with arms and persuade them to halt their missile attacks on Saudi Arabia. And the Saudi government will end its support for the Iran International Television Channel. In addition, the deal calls for enhanced economic and diplomatic ties between Iran and the GCC countries, and for Iran and its Arab partners to begin discussions on building a new regional security framework. So Maha, my first question you know, to you uh, from your vantage point there in the region, what role uh, do you think China played in bringing the agreement to fruition? And you know, how well, in your view, is the, is the agreement being adhered to by the two sides to this point? And what are your expectations going forward? And if the agreement does run into difficulties along the way, with one or both sides failing to adhere to the commitments, what role would you expect China to play in terms of enforcing the agreement? Hi, Paul. Uh, thank you for having me. It's good to see you as well. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to the discussion. In response to your question, the discussions between Saudi Arabia and uh, Iran had already been, had been in, in the works for two years. Um, they were mediated first by the Iraqis and then by the Omanis. So in a sense, Beijing came in late to the game and actually uh, you know, benefited from the fruits of the two-year uh, ongoing uh, dialogue and discussion uh, that began at the level of security services and then made its way up to the diplomatic channels. Um, 
I think the reason why Beijing was a natural choice as a guarantor for the deal is there was no other guarantor in the, in the, in the uh, and other than the fact that both Saudi Arabia and Iran would like to enhance their relationship with China, uh, it's their biggest trade partner. In their, there are multiple reasons why they would want to enhance their relationship with China. But at the same time, had they had they wanted to look for another global guarantor, there was no other. Uh, neither neither side wants to engage with the wants to give something like this to the Americans. Uh, actually, they wanted to poke. Uh, the U.S. administration in the eye, so to speak, and at the same time, Russia is out of the game. So there was there is no other major global power that is able to guarantee a deal like this. Um, what we've seen over the past few months is that two parties have been chugging along. I mean, actually, sometimes moving faster than expected on certain items in the deal. Uh, whether it's the resumption of diplomatic relations, the visits. Uh, uh, the state visits, the, uh, the uh, beginning of the talks, talks that are beginning around uh, investments, and not in Iran directly, because I mean, there are both, there's a whole other uh, issue of sanctions in terms of dealing directly with Iran. But for example, discussions now of uh, Saudi investments in Iraq, uh, where Iran has considerable influence. So at multiple levels, the different aspects of the deal are moving forward. What is not clear, and this is one aspect of the deal, which is one aspect that was announced, which is that both parties commit to non-interference in each other's affairs. Um, whilst uh, Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia seems to have dialed down uh, support to Iran International, and Iran International had to actually move from London to the United States. It was moved before the announcement came, before even the deal was signed. Um, and while you know there's been a significant ceasefire in uh, in Yemen. And in all honesty, I have to say just one caveat. I think it was the dialogue between the Saudis and the Houthis, the direct dialogue. I mean, they had bypassed the mediators. Oman was mediating, they also bypassed the mediators. But it was the direct dialogue between the Saudis and Houthis that also paved way for this deal. It wasn't the other way around. Uh, I think that the Houthis would not have spoken to the Saudis without the full endorsement of, of, of Iran, of course. But that also paved the way for, for the deal to happen. What is not clear is when we talk about non-interference in the affairs of other countries, is what this means for Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, for example, uh, or even other Gulf countries where Iran displays significant influence. Uh, in, in Syria, it's, uh, Iran has significant influence both in, in the institutional uh, structure of the country, but also through its proxy, pro different proxy forces uh, on the ground. Uh, in Syria, it's the same story. In Lebanon, you've got Hezbollah. So it's not very clear where China draws the line on, on these particular issues. Uh, and from what we can tell so far, uh, Saudi Arabia does not, I mean, it seems to have acquiesced to the reality of China's, uh, of Iran's influence in these different countries, and therefore is not pushing back. Now, should either party renege, let's say, I don't know, Saudi Arabia starts funding international Iran International again, or the Houthis don't uphold their end of the deal, uh, what will China do? That's not very clear. I don't see China at this point uh, moving in in a security, in, in a kind of a, in the, Taking, taking military action in any shape or form, that's not its usual MO. And I, I, despite the shift in its foreign policy, it doesn't have the hardware in, in the region to be able to do something like this. And maybe I'll end on just one note, yeah. is that the despite the competition between China and the United States, um, the one area where I think the United States continues to hold considerable sway is in the military arena. I mean, the United States has uh, a number uh, of military bases, specifically across the Gulf region, has historically built up security arrangements with different countries in the region, 
Um, there's the international force in Syria. So, I mean, there, there are there are different. Yeah. Uh, it has a it, it has the kind of presence that is not easy to oust. Let's put it this way. Great, Maha, that was terrific. Your reception at the beginning was not great. It was terrific at the end. I don't know what you did, but it but it, but it cleared up. And I'm just going to quickly review some of the points that you made in the in the event that our our listeners did not hear everything you said. I think you started out basically saying that while China played a role, these negotiations had been going on for some time, um, and you know China came in toward the end of the negotiations. You mentioned you know that there were many reasons. Um, that uh, Saudi Arabia uh, would want to enhance their relationship with China in this context, difficult relations with the U.S., you know, sort of poking the U.S. administration in the eyes. Uh, the Russians were not really in the picture, so they couldn't do anything. So there's no other choice, really, but China. Um, with regard to the, um, with the, with re and the relationship uh, between uh, China and Saudi had been moving faster than had been expected with a lot of state visits, a lot of investment. So Saudi-China relations uh, improving. Um, different aspects of the deal moving forward. Um, you mentioned are moving forward, um, but it will come down to this issue of non-interference in international affairs. That's really the one to watch because you mentioned the ceasefire um, in, in Yemen. Um, which also you mentioned was in large part the result of direct dialogue between Saudi and the Houthis, which was most likely endorsed by the Iranians. Uh, but this issue of non-interference uh, in international affairs, given that Iran is so involved in, in Syria, in Lebanon, significant influence there in institutional structures in the country, different proxy forces, um, uh, Syria as well, Lebanon with Hezbollah, where does China draw the line, you said, um, and the Saudi Arabia has um, seems to have acquiesced somewhat to Iranian influence in these areas. They're not pushing back on that, but it's not clear what China will do if this becomes an issue. Um, last point that you made, just to make sure everyone heard everything that you said, is that you don't expect China really uh, to move forward in a significant security way. Um, that despite U.S.-China competition, U.S. will continue to hold influence with regard to military arena, with military bases across the Gulf um, and security arrangements with different countries in the region. I hope I captured that well. Like I said, your audio cleared up at the end, so I think we're all set there. Um, you thank you very much for that. I'm going to turn to um, you, Jay, and ask her the same set of questions. Uh, what is your perspective in terms of, you know, ultimately China's role in the agreement and what it means going forward? Thank you so much, Paul. And also, firstly, let me thank Carnegie Endowment for International Peace to have invited me to speak today. I really much enjoy Mihaya's uh, comments and entirely agree with her. I think let's start it from the bottom one. Well, she, she's talking about America still remain going to be a strategic player and military strategic player within the region. I think really for China is that perhaps China is now tentatively trying to somehow provide a sense of security guarantor uh, for the region. However, the difficulty is in here lies on um, firstly, China does not really have a substantial military base within large part of Middle East region. I mean, with the exception of Djibouti. Now, secondly, I think most of China's um, military operation within the region are largely concentrated on low hanging fruit, which is, uh, for example, anti piracy and Coast Guard um, supervision. So these are the elements, the security provisions that China has been entertained, has been engaged with in so far. So that is on the security side. I think what we're going to see is we're going to see a very timid, tentative steps made from Beijing. Now let's look into the more um, substantial blocks on economic and diplomacy side. And obviously on the economic side, um, as we know that uh, Middle East region come across has been a very significant source of raw material supply for China. And for example, Saudi Arabia, I mean, the Chinese total import of oil from Saudi Arabia is around 20%. I mean, imagine the size and scale. And then, of course, Iran was among another country which has been a substantial source of um, energy supply for China as well. So this is an energy security front that has been traditional concern 
and also traditionally China's national interest regarding its engagement with the Middle East. Um, secondly, I think what we have also seen in here is on the significant elements of foreign direct investment from China and going to countries in Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Oman, and the tenant of the Belt and Road Initiative. So, um, and also partially to do with the particular type of government that Middle East region has, and then that makes the government contract much easier for the Chinese state-owned enterprises to negotiate with, and that is at a central level. Now, also interestingly, at the provincial level, that some Western provinces of China, for example, Qinghai, Gansu, um, traditionally have a very close ties because of the Muslim population, the close ties with main region within Saudi Arabia as well. So those provincial governments become a natural diplomatic player within the region too, beside the central players from Beijing. So this economic element obviously has been something extremely substantial and also come to the digital economy element as well. Given uh, the entire debate of talking about the digital Silk Road, and seems that Huawei will be able to easily find its customers in the Middle East um, on its 5G network. So that digital element also somehow fit into China's foreign affairs agenda. So this is all the economic side. China has been, I have no doubt, has been very serious economic player within the region. Now, on the diplomatic side, that seems to be more ambivalent, I would say, in here. Even though in the past few years, I think, China has provided image within the Middle East that speak to every single party and talk to every single person, have given no favors, no preferences on individual political parties at all. And that seems to be a perfect image has been constructed, has been acting as a peace broker on this deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia. So that China has really laid the foundation in the past few years already. So that is only talking about at the regional level. Now, let's talk about a competition at a global level. So while we're talking about the great power rivalry between China and the United States, China seems to realize its much strained relationship with US-led West is not going to improve at any time soon. I think the leadership has been made very clear on the 20th Party Congress and followed by National People's Congress earlier this year. So Middle East region has the largest number of the so-called global south. And if Beijing is very keen to deploy its so-called global development initiative and the global security initiative, and the Middle East region that seems to come across as being one of the um, easiest place to putting those GDI and GSI in practice. So for really from a diplomatic front, I would say Beijing has this whole idea, this whole notion of well, given Russia's invasion towards Ukraine, and then perhaps it's not easy to develop, to develop this relationship with the West. But however, Middle East is now seems to be really taking the priority on Chinese diplomacy. So all this add together somehow, we make a, a rather complicated picture for China. Let me draw the line here. China is not exactly a strategic player within the region, but China still come across as being a transactional player within the region. Great, Eugenia, that's very helpful. Um, your point that, first of all, on the security side, you know, China is, is not, a, a, you know, a significant player. They don't have substantial military bases um, and they don't have a huge security footprint. On the economic side, this is really, uh, I think, where you felt the most substantial gains and interaction, obviously, on the energy supply. Um, on the uh, diplomatic side, ambivalent, I think you described it. I've heard uh, Chinese diplomats say our goal in the Middle East is to get along with every country, uh, to not take sides, uh, you know, to make friends across the, the Middle East region. And as you said, that's created a good image for China. On the global side, with strains in US-China relations, obviously the global South becomes much more important. Um, you know, with the war in Ukraine, it's the global South that seems to, where China's narrative seems to be getting quite a bit of traction. Um, and that may be where a big piece of their play uh, goes forward diplomatically as they roll out the Global Security Initiative, Global Development Initiative. And I, I sense that the China brokered Iran Saudi deal will be a concrete example uh, that they will present as what the Global Security Initiative means at the end of the day. So they, 
can get some currency out of that. Thank you very much. Benjamin, I'm going to turn to you now. You know, what's your sense on the role China played in bringing the agreement uh, to fruition? And uh, what are your expectations going forward? Thanks, Paul. Uh, I guess being the last speaker, I really don't have anything radically new to say, but I'll just uh, chip in with some observations, which perhaps might echo what uh, Maha and UCA earlier uh, mentioned. Um, I mean, my first thought uh, when it comes to the peace deal is the idea that nature abhors a vacuum. So the very fact that the United States left the Middle East or was perceived to have left the, the Middle East uh, in some ways uh, allowed China to, to have its foot in. Uh, but I think that said, I would totally concur with what Yu Jie mentioned earlier that Chinese interest in the Middle East is not strategic, but transactional. I think that's very important to note. Uh, we have spoken to Chinese uh, visitors in the past month or so coming to Singapore, and many of them say that Middle East, they, they recognize the Middle East is a far more complicated region uh, and, and, it's not, and with, with a history that spans thousands of years. So I don't think the Chinese are in any illusions that they're going there in a big way and to sort of change the regional architecture or the situation in the Middle East uh, in a big way. I think, as you rightly pointed out, the idea is let's just go in Get to know, get to know our folks there, um, make friends, and and see what we can do. I, I don't think the Chinese uh, view the Middle East in a manner they view, say, Southeast Asia. I mean, one, it's, it's very obvious in terms of uh, the interests. Uh, they do not have any key territorial disputes in the Middle East, so it, it makes China in a way uh, very easy. There, there's nothing uh, controversial about China going in. Uh, one could say. If, from the Middle Eastern countries' perspective, there is nothing to dislike about China, since uh, essentially that there are no key uh, disputes, uh, particularly territorial ones. So I would say uh, that that's a, that frames the manner in which China has has a sort of easier task in, in in going into the Middle East. I think we also need to recognize during the coronavirus pandemic in the past three years, uh, it would seem that China's uh, in the Middle East, many mis Middle Eastern countries obtain their vaccines from China. So I would say that had, that way probably went some way to create that kind of reservoir of goodwill between uh, China and the Middle East. Again, from, from conversations I had with friends in the Middle East, they would say that the, the perception of China in the Middle East is a relatively uh, positive one. At least uh, not, you don't see the level of, of, of complicated uh, perceptions that you find in Southeast Asia in the Middle East. So I think on that count, uh, China has it, uh, a far more uh, uh, receptive uh, population, both among the, the, the both within the political elite and also uh, general public opinion. Great, thank you very much. So you agree with you, Jia? Uh, China's interest in the Middle East not strategic, but yet transactional. And if you're, I would you're say it's at, pretty transactional for the time being. And if you're looking at a transactional approach, the most important thing is that you have friends uh, across the region to do transactions. And as you said, China, the perception of China is pretty positive across the Middle East. Maybe Maha can shed a little more light on that from her perspective as we go forward. I wanna just ask, and I'll, I'll ask you, Jia, I'll start with you, Jia. So we hear hints from the Chinese from time to time about a potential role uh, in the in, in de-escalating the Israeli-Palestinian issue, uh, and even potentially, you know, the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, one one could argue, you know, these are each of them are quite different and unique in their own terms, and arguably, arguably, much more complex than the uh, Saudi-Iran restoration of relations. But what's your sense? I mean, you said in your comments that on the diplomatic side, China is ambivalent. Yet they continue to hint that they want to explore paying, playing some role on these. How much progress in your mind can China feasibly make here? And is China prepared you know, to expand, expend the political capital necessary to really address these issues? Well, thank you, Paul. Um, very great question. I'm not sure if I can offer a satisfied answer judging by very limited public resources on, on this subject. Um, I think that they, um, obviously the, to mediate Palestine, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, that would require much thorough understanding with the Middle East region in itself. And it also has to come across as being a neutral player between the two. 
even though China has remained with relatively good relationship with Israel in the past. However, I think China's support towards Palestine was in the UN. That has already come across as being something that China does not being considered as being neutral. So I think that's the one challenge in here on um, working this um, um, Palestine and Israel um, settlement, firstly. Now, secondly, you mentioned on GCPOA. The GCPOA, the direction of travel, is not entirely depending on China or United States, but also depending on European unions, as well as Russia. And I think in the past, as even though that we seems to be see this much agreement between China and the Russia, but when it comes to the image that Russia come perceive that China seems somehow become a competitor on its engagement with the Middle East as well. So I think there might be potential element of disagreement between Beijing and Moscow regarding to what extent China will be play a much bigger role as being a peace settlement provider within the region. So I think given the GCOP here, the complexity for it is really beyond just a single country can handle that diplomacy. And also look, given the current really strained ties between Beijing and Washington, and whatever Washington says these days, and Beijing will ultimately oppose. Uh, so that is almost make a GCPOA, they are almost like impossible. So that is the, the second element. Now, third element, it comes to the domestic element within China is regarding the expertise on the Middle East specialist. So before I come to join this webinar, and I actually did a bit search in here, the Middle East expertise within China remains small in numbers compared with, for example, the expertise about US foreign policy or about European studies within China. So well, even though China has the intention of playing a much bigger role, but I think you do need to have the capability and capacity to sustain that level of ambition. And also this is due to do with the fact that is China really willing to be stretch itself that far? Or instead, China may just be concentrating its great power competition within its own neighboring, within its neighborhood in Southeast Asia and Central Asia. So I think also for China is how, how much resources to be able to really 100% devoted to Middle East. And that for me is a question with men unclear at this stage. But nevertheless, I think Beijing is making this, presenting this narrative by make itself, present itself as being a peace deal maker and start, set in stark contrast with the United States by, by being a country that only supply weapons. And that is a narrative Beijing wants to make. Terrific. Um, thank you for that. Your point on JCPOA is, is an interesting one. It's not really just a regional diplomatic play. It's really global. Um, and that, and it's much more sophisticated. And it involves the U.S. and the great deal of antagonism right now between the two would make it very difficult. Um, and so, you know, in addition to expertise, capacity issues and, and resources, very, very good points. Maha, I want to ask you the same question, but I'm going to add a question for you. So you'll get, give you two. In addition to that question, just your thoughts on, you know, the potential for China to play a role on those two vexing diplomatic challenges in the Middle East. Um, I want to get a sense uh, from you how countries in the Middle East are navigating this U.S.-China competition. Um, you know, Benjamin will tell you, he sits out here in the region and he knows when it comes to Southeast Asia, what's often heard from, you know, in the United States is that countries in the Southeast Asia don't want to choose sides between the U.S. and China as the two compete for economic and political influence in the Asia Pacific region and in particular Southeast Asia. How is this dynamic playing out, Maha, in the Middle East? Are countries able to benefit from U.S.-China competition by playing the two sides uh, off of one another, or, or do they face costs from hedging between Washington and Beijing? Do they say they don't want to choose? Do we hear similar language in that regard? How do they navigate the U.S.-China competition? I think you're on mute, Maha, sorry. Uh, 
There we go. Uh, there we go. Uh, I think they absolutely do not want to choose, and they say it very clearly, not just with China, but even with also with Russia. Uh, I mean, just the first, perhaps the most glaring example is uh, the hedging over Ukraine, but also with the issue of oil prices, even, you know, um, brought President Biden to Saudi Arabia after saying repeatedly that uh, Saudi Arabia was a prior state because of its treatment of, uh, because of the murder of uh, Khashoggi, the journalist uh, at the Saudi embassy in Turkey. So uh, they are absolutely hedging their bets. They're making clear that they will no longer toe the line uh, on any front and that they will do what they believe is in their national interests. And if their national interest dictates a relationship with China, uh, greater trade relations, uh, the Saudis have just struck a deal with Huawei. Uh, so it, they're going to go ahead and do it. Um, there are discussions of payments in one, not in the not in dollar. So I think that's a bit uh, far down the road. I don't think it's going to happen now. But what I'm saying is that there is, there are signs and there are uh, actions. It's basically words that are being said, but also actions being taken that indicate uh, that countries across the region to varying degrees are trying to hedge their bets. They're trying to improve and maximize their relationship with China, particularly on, on, on economic and trade issues. And we're seeing also some security cooperation. It's still not very clear, but uh, for example, on the issues uh, in, in, in areas of technology uh, and cybersecurity, uh, which have security implications. So there, there is, growing cooperation there. Uh, but at the same time, their security relation or their relationship with the US, which is uh, being shaken, but it's uh, it's still ongoing. As you said, Secretary Blinken was in Saudi Arabia just a few days ago. So it's, uh, it's still there and neither party wants to break it off. So neither the Saudis nor other Gulf countries nor the United States want to break off that relationship. Let's remember that the United States, even though it has reoriented, that has strategically reoriented its position in the region, it wants to withdraw its troops out, but it has not turned away from the region completely. It has redefined its strategic objectives. Its strategic objectives in the region are the security of maritime uh, lanes, uh, the nuclear file, uh, the security of Israel. So there are strategic objectives that it has, which have not gone away. Actually, they've just been strengthened. The fight against ISIS and terrorism. This is their, their how they've defined their own objectives. So I think we need to keep this in mind. When it comes to the JCPOA and Palestine, on the JCPOA, the one thing I would say is actually it is an opportunity for there to be some sort of cooperation between China and the United States, despite the current situation. Because if there's one thing they agree on, neither party wants to see a nuclear Iran. So there is a potential for cooperation there if, if both parties are willing. Um, in terms of uh, Palestine, I think that a negotiation the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict, I think, honestly, I think it was just a comment out of the blue. Um, the, 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 seriously, I mean, the, the, the Palestinian, I mean, uh, uh, the, um, China comes in and says, we will not impose our vision on anybody, which is, I know people in the region here like this approach to, 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 to negotiations. No one's going to impose anything on us in the way the Americans do. However, at the end of the day, if you look at the Chinese, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, it's a very asymmetrical one. You've got a, uh, an, actually, it's an apartheid system that's in place. You've got one country occupying, uh, not another country, but occupying territories. The two-state solution in all honesty is no more. What we're looking at is a one-state reality. More than half a million settlers have settled in the West Bank after the Oslo Agreement the peace agreement that was supposed to pave the way for the creation of an independent Palestinian state. So it's a very asymmetrical situation. The power structure is asymmetrical. One party holds most of the power, not to say all of it. So it's very, it's very hard for China to come in and say, I'm going to negotiate an acceptable peace in this kind of a very, very complex environment where it, it actually has no skin in the game. Um, so I, I think it's, I, I just don't see how it's going to do that unless it's willing to uh, put some of its political uh, uh, capital in 
forcing the two sides together and trying to see what it can do to work. And I, I haven't seen any moves by yeah. China on any file in the region to move in that direction. Yeah, no, that's helpful. One quick follow-up. We have a question from the audience, uh, and I just want to ask you as a follow-up before I turn to Benjamin and ask him uh, some questions on the GSI, Global Security Initiative. But we got a question from Nara Azwada. Um, and I'm going to turn it to Maha. And the question is about, and I want to I want to ask you what you see, what the region sees in terms of how the United States is responding to China's rising influence. What's the view in the region? Is the United States remain, does it appear that they remain confident in their position? They're willing to kind of share some responsibility. Of course, the Americans for over a decade now have been saying China should play a larger role in the Middle East. China has stepped forward to play this diplomatic role. Um, but given the current state of the relationship, I'm not sure how comfortable the U.S. is with that at this particular time, even though in the past the U.S. has said China needs to step up uh, their role, which is an interesting dynamic. But what's the view in the Middle East of how the U.S. is responding to all of this? Well, I, unfortunately, I think they see the U.S. as saying one thing and meaning another uh, on, on multiple files, not just in terms of China. Um, and I think in terms of China in particular, what they see is that the U.S. is worried about China's uh, influence. Uh, they, they're not so worried about, I mean, again, the perception from the region, the growing trade agreements, China is a natural partner for, for the region, especially for Gulf countries, uh, economic cooperation, all of this is fine. It's the political, uh, the growing political influence that I think is, is they, they find uh, worrisome. They, they think the U.S. finds worrisome. And so they're trying to play both sides of the game and see, you know, how they can maximize their own gains from that. Um, mm. But for the region, yeah, yeah, they, they, they see you as, as a worried partner, but not worried sufficiently to come in with, you know, uh, charging and saying, everybody out, this is my own, uh, uh, <laughs> this is my backyard. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. Okay, we've talked about the Global Security Initiative, the Global Development Initiative, we've mentioned those. There's a third one now called the Global Civilization Initiative. Um, and these are being sort of rolled out by the Chinese leadership now, putting forward, you know, uh, alternative ideas and con concepts around, you know, how large powers should exercise their influence in the world. Much of it, I think, contrasts with uh, the way the United States exercises its power. And we see China really emphasizing the diplomatic piece, the dialogue piece, as opposed to the United States, where uh, it also uh, has a military component that goes along with its diplomacy. Traditionally, China's been focused primarily on economic engagement in the Middle East, as we talked about through the Belt and Road, trade investment. But, you know, we've talked about potentially a growing interest on political issues by China. What about these new foreign policy initiatives? How, what, in your sense, how are these being perceived in the region? How important are they for China? You know, UGA has said they're important in terms of the global South. And in that regard, the Middle East uh, plays a part there. Do you think countries in the Middle East welcome these initiatives? Do they know what these initiatives are? Um, what's your sense uh, on those uh, questions? Thank you. So my sense is that countries in the Middle East generally welcome these initiatives because there's nothing to reject. I mean, it's, it's, it's framed in, in all very nice uh, and, and helpful language. So there is really nothing threatening in those uh, languages. There is, I don't think there is many mention of, of wanting countries to be liberal democracies or things like that. So I think on that part, the, the language is worded in a way that, that leaves very little to disagree. I think what we need to see is how uh, in the coming years, uh, what kind of uh, actual plans are being implemented as opposed to just these initiatives. I think one point that I've recently observed is that uh, obviously in 2021, we had this era of Chinese wolf warrior diplomacy. I would say after the 20th Party Congress, uh, it would seem that the Chinese government uh, and its foreign ministry has certainly put forth a much more 
reconciliatory tone uh, with regards to countries uh, outside. Certainly, uh, when it comes to United States, it, it really depends on how what the United States say and they sort of uh, respond accordingly. But I think, broadly speaking, uh, it would seem that uh, Chinese have put on a much more softer tone in its foreign relations. And I don't know whether that's uh, intentional or part of this global security, global development initiative, or whether that's just part of uh, a shift in its foreign uh, policy. Um, so I, one, one interesting point I think uh, Maha was mentioning earlier was that uh, countries in the Middle East uh, complain that the U.S. says one thing and mean another. Uh, if you look back at the Shangri-La dialogue just past week, uh, I think there were a couple of people who questioned the Chinese uh, as of saying one thing and meaning another in the region in Southeast Asia. So I don't know whether these are, parallel, these are similarities uh, across regions that we could sort of uh, extract some value in terms of uh, comparing how America is perceived in the Middle East vis-a-vis -vis how China is perceived in Southeast Asia where I am. So that's something really to, to sort of make comparisons. Thank you very much, Benjamin. And let, let me, could, if I could with you, come back to this question about how countries in the Middle East are navigating US-China competition. You're well aware because you're here in the region in the Southeast Asia of the, you know, of how Southeast Asian countries deal with this, this notion not to choose sides um, and, you know, really want to uh, find ways to benefit uh, from China, in particular on the economic and trade piece, but often rely on the United States for security and other other public goods. Um, how do you, as somebody from, as an expert from this region, see that playing out in the Middle East? Are there differences, similarities? You know, what, in your sense, how do you see that playing out there? Well, I, I don't know a lot uh, about how the, the deep perceptions of, me, the, of the Middle East, but from what I've read and from maybe some of the students I've taught at the Defense Academy from the Middle East, it would seem that uh, China is perceived in a much more, uh, I guess one, one thing to note is that China has less baggage, historical baggage in the Middle East. And that certainly helps in a region that has so much historical baggage, uh, even in the absence of outside powers. So not having that historical baggage provides China with some form of a clean slate, so to speak, and to navigate. Uh, and, and the point is that a lot of the current arrangements, uh, I mean, China is certainly not going um, I mean, in terms of, uh, I mean, the Middle East isn't, isn't challenging China with regards to, say, Xinjiang, the Uyghurs issue. And I think they sort of keep some of these uh, more uh, contested issues uh, outside the, the relationship. It's, as what UTA mentioned earlier, very transactional. And, and I say, uh, in so far as this is transactional and you sort of don't interfere into the what's happening in China and what's happening in the Middle East, I think the relationship can be kept on an even keel. But I think if you want to deepen the relationship, then at some point, you're going to start touching on some of these hot potato issues. And I think that's where the, the rubber meets the road. Uh, I, I don't think we'll reach that stage yet, if we ever reach that. Uh, but that's, that really remains to be seen. Thank you very much. UJ, on the security side, you know, you mentioned in your comments that I think you said China was a tentative provider of security guarantees. Um, not a lot of, uh, you know, substantial presence. But in recent years, we do see China becoming more involved, uh, selling arms to regional players, uh, armed drones they've sold to countries like Saudi Arabia, UAE, Egypt, Iraq, Jordan. Uh, China has also built um, military and potentially dual use uh, facilities in places like Djibouti. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned Djibouti, but also Israel, Egypt, and the UAE um, are places where they're exploring or setting up, uh, uh, you know, considering setting things up. We also saw recently, uh, with regard to the Sudan conflict, the 43rd uh, People's Liberation Army Naval Task Force, which normally is engaged in anti-piracy patrols off the Gulf of Aden, they after the outbreak of Sudan, they were shifted over to that region um, to help to evacuate more than 1,300 Chinese nationals uh, in Sudan. So, I mean, how do you anticipate this security dimension playing out over the near to middle term? Are there indicators that would uh, 
you know, point to greater security in involvement and a larger security footprint? What's your sense there? Thank you, Paul. Um, I think I'll just to follow up what Benjamin have just said earlier um, on this uh, uh, tentative step. And also somehow as the relationship between China and the MENA region gone deeper, and China either willingly or unwillingly will have to engage with some of the hard security subject and also provide hard security provisions. Now, the question is firstly, whether China willing to do so. And secondly, it may not really depend on China because as learned from by United States by being a great power and you obviously carry great, greater responsibility irrespective of China like it or not. And China will still have to perform some sense of security duty, I think, in the medium term. And firstly, for the regional relationship to consolidate its relationship with the region. But I think secondly, also as a way of protecting its economic interest, protecting its investment interest within the region as well, like what has happened within Central Asia. So I think give, having that in mind, I think that's a part of the reason why China is very keen to expand Shanghai Cooperation Organization, hoping that some of the MENA, MENA countries origin members would be able to sign up on that organization and trying to feel more comfortably to work with that tent, that sense of multilateral international organizations led by China, not necessarily in, in joining, for example, um, G7 or NATO, so and so speaking. So I think that's what um, China is very keen to do. Now, second piece in here is also come to the significant presence that MENA region would have within the UN as well. So beyond the security, beyond obvious security in engagement, and China was also hoping that every time when it comes to the votes within the United Nations, that MENA region would vote in, in accordance to China's preferences, as long as that preferences are in favor by China or neutral by China, as long as it's not something that against the United States, it is always in China's favor. So I think China also considered this as almost in a zero sum sense to a large extent that either providing a military um, cooperation or involvement with the UN and really much hope that MENA region would be one of another sources that would, that would counter America's global influence. Thank you very much for that. We've got just a few minutes, and I want to ask uh, a set of questions to the three of you before we wrap up on the Belt and Road Initiative and, and on some other economic issues. Of course, we've mentioned the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, there are signs that the Belt and Road Initiative is, is wavering. Um, and, and of course, we know it's uh, President Xi Jinping's sort of flagship foreign policy initiative, and it's... Uh, it's uh, 10 years old, I believe, this year. Uh, the Middle East, of course, we've talked about it. It's an important region for China uh, along that maritime belt and the Silk Road uh, aspects of the Belt and Road Initiative. Energy flows are important in particular. Um, recently, however, it seems that the Belt and Road is facing some difficulties as developing countries around the world come under financial stress due to inflation and the residual effects, economic effects of the pandemic. Countries in the Middle East like uh, Turkey and Egypt in particular have already received rescue packages from Beijing to finance their outstanding debts. Let me start with Maha, if I could. What is your sense um, in the Middle East? Is there, is there concern, is there a view that the Belt and Road uh, seems to be slowing down uh, is there concern? How does that issue look like? And if so, what does that say about China's future economic engagement in the region? Yes, I feel, honestly, uh, Paul, I think there is concern around the Belt and Road Initiative, as you said, because of the greater uh, debt burden on several countries in the region, including uh, Egypt, by the way which is uh, it's that is simply not sustainable today. So there is growing uh, distress at that level, but we see uh, China uh, expanding its economic initiatives 
uh, not through the Belt and Road, but not necessarily through the Belt and Road, but the other other kinds of agreements with Gulf countries, with Saudi Arabia, with Morocco, and with others. So I think there is a sense, not that the Belt and Road is in, is in distress, but actually that there's a strengthening of the relationship with China uh, beyond the Belt and Road as such. And China has invested something of the order of $273 billion in the region uh, between 2005 and 2022, I believe, uh, which is a significant amount. Some of it is, has to do with oil and some of it has to do with actual uh, investments in, in the region. Um, so, yeah, in short, there isn't the uh, panic that uh, mm. this is failing and therefore we, we need to find alternatives. But there is worry that we cannot carry the debt that in some cases China has brought to our doors. You know, this, this new dynamic where, you know, we have seen Saudi Arabia and Iran, for example, using renminbi uh, in trading, you know, oil instead of uh, U.S. dollars. And I want to get your sense of whether you think this will be harmful to U.S. influence uh, in the Middle East over the long term and how, how serious of a trend is this and what, what can we expect on that? Thank you. Um, I think this is partially to do with the currency exchanges between the bilateral currency agreement between those countries. It's not necessarily a sign to show that maybe internationalization is gathering pains because judging by the currency uh, convertibility across the globe is not judging by the supply, but it's really judging by the demand. And we can all say that the, the predominant countries in the world are still using dollars as being the transaction clearance currency. And even the Belt and Road Initiative, I mean, I think the 99% of the Belt and Road Initiative financial resources are still cleared under US dollar. So even if we have experiencing Beijing has been tentatively trying to have some kind of currency swap deals. But this does not necessarily mean that they're trying to somehow pivot away from US dollar because I think because of the structure power, the exuberant privilege of US dollars remains to be there. So that is one economic element. Now, come back to the Belt and Road Initiative. I think the entire initiative already began to dial down ever since April 2019. Um, during the second Belt and Road Forum, when um, the Chinese government has not really pledged any fresh state capital to support the initiative. So what are we going to experience? I mean, as I mentioned earlier, it's no longer just the Chinese central government as a player to get involved in Belt and Road and to continue the Belt and Road. And instead, I think particularly for MENA region, is the China's Western provinces would play mm -hmm. a, has already played a bigger role and I think will play even greater role and for the Belt and Road Initiative to be implemented in the Middle East. So, mm -hmm. and then we also complained by the GDI, even though the budget of GDI is 10 times less than BRI, but I think nevertheless, let's also keep eyes on that as well. I'm expecting more and more MENA regions, countries, and also sign up um, the, the GDI at the same time, join the so-called friends groups of the GDI with the UN. Terrific, watch for the uh, Western provinces, uh, Gansu, I think you mentioned before, Qinghai. That's one Qinghai, yeah. <laughs> and, and also watch for the GDI. Thank you for that. Benjamin, you're going to get the last word tonight. Um, what's your views on the Belt and Road going forward um, and, and other economic issues, uh, prospects in the Middle East? Well, uh, my, 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 what I'll say is that the Belt and Road, as you rightly pointed out, has been very muted. Uh, obviously, uh, I it's it's unclear some of these. Uh, I mean, we just saw the the, the current uh, Jakarta to Bandung uh, high speed rail uh, having running into problems again, notwithstanding uh, President Xi being in, in Jakarta uh, earlier to sort of make a grand statement. So I think what we are the problem is not so much that there is uh, there it's not a lack of political will, but the implementation. Uh, and this implementation is often the case where if the earlier, if, if you do not conduct proper studies and it's just purely as a result of some kind of uh, political uh, decision, then you're going to run into trouble down the road. Uh, so I think in, in the Middle East, uh, I'm, I'm not, again, not very familiar with one of the in investments. Uh, should, I mean, in, in any given time, some investments work, others don't. Uh, but I think the bigger point 
And a bigger question really to be asked is whether uh, for China, whether they see this uh, money going out as a cost to its own economy because uh, Chinese economy is also slowing down. So we cannot assume that, that there is that the appetite to sort of having outward investment is something that will be sustainable in the long run. So that, that kind of balance between uh, outward investment and domestic uh, investment is something that is going, in my view, uh, that's going to occupy the minds of, of many Chinese uh, central bankers and, and, and leaders in the coming years. Important point, watch the Chinese economy and what happens there and what the implications Absolutely. are for China's economic interaction in the Middle East. Important point to end on, Maha Yaya, Dr. Yu Jia, Benjamin Ho, thank you very much for joining the terrific discussion tonight uh, as part of our Carnegie China Global Dialogue Series, looking at the Middle East China relations. It's been a terrific discussion and we look forward to having you back sometime soon. Thank you. Thank you so much for posting this.